Welcome to the Drive-By Entrepreneur Podcast, which exists to bring current and compelling content to entrepreneurs and influencers of small to mid-sized organizations. I'm John Frank, fellow entrepreneur and the owner of Third Road Management. And with this podcast, we will connect with a variety of experienced and dynamic individuals to shed some light on both the art and science of entrepreneurship. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors. First, my very own Third Road Management, a company that brings fractional CFO services to small and mid-sized organizations by revolutionizing the CFO suite. We'd also like to thank Two Hound Red, a brewery and restaurant located in Glen Ellyn, Illinois, that is focused on creating classic, innovative beer and food. And finally, we'd like to thank NWC Media, which provides inbound marketing technology, project workflow management, and efficiency consulting to organizations of varied sizes, who is also the producer of the Drive-By Entrepreneur podcast. All right, Tyler Qualio, welcome to the Drive-By Entrepreneur podcast. Uh, you and I are officially podcasters for the first time. How does it feel? Feels great. I love being the guinea pig, you know, it's wonderful. All right, great. Uh, I want to go through this. This is the first time for us, obviously. Uh, so just to kind of set the stage for uh, where we're going, why we're doing this, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I got it written down, but the Drive-By Entrepreneur Podcast exists to bring current and compelling content to entrepreneurs and influencers of small to mid-sized organizations, right? So uh, there's a whole plethora of people that are subject matter experts in their respective fields. Uh, we all sort of intertwine and interact with uh, entrepreneurs that are all potentially, you know, struggling with some of the same issues or, you know, ideas that they're wrestling with or whatever it might be. So the idea is that this is going to be a forum for people to go and learn some things that might be relevant to their organization and apply. Them. So that's uh, great. That's what it's all about. But give you an opportunity. Uh, you and I obviously know each other uh, prior to this, but wanted to give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about you, uh, what you do, what draws you to it, and uh, what you think, you know, you is the unique, uh, special sauce that you and your firm, Sentinus, uh, you know, bring to people. Right. Well, like I said earlier, thanks for having me, and being the first one is always uh, nerve-wracking, but also uh, um, humbling. So, thanks for having me. Um, I am president of a custom wealth management firm in Oakbrook called Sentinus, and we work with a lot of closely held business owners, and we touch a lot of areas of their life. We always say, uh, look at everything in life with a dollar sign on it. And if there's gaps, holes, missed opportunities, we try to put them in a position to, to correct those. And a lot of that comes down to estate planning, business succession, do a lot of modeling uh, around their entire financial situation. Basically, not so much when can they retire, but when can, when can they go to work because they want to, not because they have to, you know, financial independence. And then we do some risk management stuff for them to make sure there's nothing that can blow up their situation and then ultimately help them invest their money. And that's, that's kind of our story. So you, I've heard you say this before, the everything in someone's life with a dollar sign. Yeah. Right? Like, I think most people, like, when I heard that, you say that for the first time, I was like, oh, that's a really interesting way of saying that because... Um, I hadn't thought about it that way before. And I think most people probably don't connect the dots between, you know, what does that mean? So like, just what are some handles on some things? Cause obviously people are thinking, oh, my 401k or my, you yeah. know, this or that, you know, kind of thing. What are some other like context for dollar signs? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think a lot of times people think of a financial advisor or an investment advisor, uh, strictly helping with their portfolio. And there's, Plenty of people out there that have firms like that and good friends of mine and they're wildly successful and it's, it's great. They just decide to take one area of kind of the, uh, the pie and focus solely on that and do a great job with it. We, however, just our business model happens to be that we'd rather touch all the different areas of someone's financial life and work with a small number of clients and go a little bit deeper. And then again, it's not... Uh, better or worse per se than these other people, but it's just kind of what we found works out well for us. So to answer your question, a lot of times people have, um, they think estate planning just revolves around wills and trusts and what happens if something happens to me, and that's obviously incredibly important, but 
in our country, if you end up having too much wealth, um, you can define that in a bunch of different ways. But the IRS uh, likes to line up and get their piece on the back end. So we do a lot of wealth transfer. Um, beyond that, we also help people try to determine what they're going to leave for their families. Is it enough? Um, is it adequate? You know, who's going to get it? How do they get it? So in that area of estate planning, there's some dollar sign elements there. Then on the business succession side, which I know we've talked about in the past and we'll probably address here in a little bit, but there's, there's things around um, a business, whether they, if they're an employee somewhere, they have a bunch of plans with weird acronyms and they don't know what they mean and they're yeah. busy with their life and their kids and their family and work and, and they get all this uh, stuff sent to them from their, from their employer and they don't really understand the magnitude of, of what those plans can, can result for them. So we, we help uh, translate that for them. We help set up deferred comp plans for business owners, you know, 401ks, all these things inside the business world that come up with, uh, again, uh, dollar sign. Yeah. Then on the actual modeling part, a lot of people will sit down and say, I make this, I spend this, I have this much in the bank, I have this much in my portfolio, I'm going to open up an Excel spreadsheet, I'm going to slap a, a growth rate on of, you know, six, seven percent, and Oh, I can retire in 10 years. I know I'm okay. Right. But in reality, um, that's a very linear way of looking at it. Right. And that would mean that the, the market would have to go 6 or 7% every year. And as we sit here today, it's a, it's a tough day in the market. And we know one thing is true is that it never goes like this. Yeah. It goes like this. So we do some pretty sophisticated probability modeling to help people determine uh, stress test their situation. Um, what's, a, what's a success rate? Uh, Let's leave it up to statistical analysis instead of just a flat rate that we know is never going to happen. So that's very dollar sign intensive. Yeah. That's looking at, again, earnings and existing portfolio and spending and uh, wealth transfer uh, goals down the road, but also the impact of taxes and inflation and all these things. And then also people have uh, life insurance, disability insurance, long-term care insurance. They have all these different kind of risk management tools that they've bought over time or that they were told they should own, but they aren't sure, so they avoided them. So what we do is we, um, we make sense of all that as well in a very open architecture, kind of independent way. We don't, you know, we don't work for particular companies, so we can kind of navigate those waters for people. And then ultimately, the final area is what people expect when we talk about being a financial advisor, and that's the uh, vast majority of our uh, specialties and our, our revenues come from helping people manage uh, their investments. So yeah. there's dollar signs galore on that. As yeah. Manage. Yeah. I think most people tend to think about, um, you know, their wealth strategy or, um, you know, very literally in the sense of like saying to themselves, like, how much do I need to yeah. retire? Right. I, or how much do I need to retire and still maintain you know, the lifestyle I am living and or on the end of that, leave something for my kids. Yep. And the reality is, is it's a lot more complex, right? There's certainly the, um, you know, growth rate assumptions that are, you know, in terms of like, what do you have now versus what will it be in five years, 10 years, 20 years, you know, whatever, right? But then mm -hmm. there's also what are you adding to it? There's, you know, the rising costs of just about everything, particularly, <laughs> you know, this day and age, right? Yeah. You know, so it's a much more um, nuanced. Um, it's a perfect word for it. Yeah, it's a much more nuanced, uh, you know, formulation than I think, uh, you know, a lot of people give it credit for. Um, so that's one of the things that I really appreciate. But then the other part of it is, you know, I feel like where your business and our business intersect a lot is around uh, risk management tools, succession tools, mm -hmm. what if scenario tools, how do I do this? Um, because like, like me, I think you've seen probably the gamut of different situations, whether it be, uh, you know, tragic passing of someone yeah. or uh, an employee that wants to buy a business or, um, you know, any number of factors, right? There, there could be generational pass down, you know, of stock within an organization. Yes. Uh, there could be, you know, two brothers or sisters that want to be part of the business, one that doesn't no. want to be part of it. Like, it just, it's never A plus B equals C. It's always, it, it's somewhere in the gray. So. I agree. Well, you and I have talked recently, right? And I, 
I commented that every business will either be liquidated, transferred, or sold. And if business owners just kind of grasp that concept and know that one day it will end in a certain way, they can be more purposeful and, and intentional about which one of those they want. And when you talk about tragic passings, there's in my career, we've seen a number of situations where people who are left after the business owner goes yep. um, take the money and the assets the business owner had left and plow it in thinking, you know, dad wanted us to save the business. He would have liked anything or to, to, for us to do anything we could to keep this thing yeah, going. This, this was dad. You yeah. Know, like, yeah. And, you know very likely dad's up in heaven yelling down like, oh my gosh, please shutter it, you know, transfer it, stop pouring all the money down, you know, because right. oftentimes what happens is they do that and then they end up shuttering it anyway. And um, if people just would have had those conversations ahead of time, and, you know, had buy-sell agreements in place and, and had some risk management tools around it um, and, and determine which, which route they wanted to go in the event something happened. And then obviously there's the really fun part, which is, not if someone passes away, you know, not going away, but more along the lines of um, who's going to be the next generation? Do we sell to a strategic? Do we not? And that's why I know you and I have connected quite a bit is in your business, which we really appreciate, is there are certain things that a business should do to make their, their uh, business more saleable and more transferable and even in some ways more liqui uh, liquidatable. Is that a word? <laughs> but I think you guys do a lot of that. And it's been a really good connection for us to work together on those situations. Yeah, absolutely. When, when, when you and I talked about that sentence for the first time, that I'm just going to say every business will be A, liquidated, B, transferred, or C, sold. And then we actually use voluntarily or involuntarily. <laughs> yes, that's right? a good way to say it. And that seems like a, like a very draconian sentence, mm -hmm. right? Like when, when I read it. Yeah, it's like, not meant to scare people. So yeah, no, no, no. Fact, it's it like, can be, you know? but if you read it, like, with the appropriate amount of weight, I'd mm -hmm. say. Um, it's very true and very like humbling in a way. Mm -hmm. And I start to think of like, like, oh my gosh, this is one area that like business owners, definitely not across the board, but business owners in general are like totally unprepared. Yeah. Well, for, yeah. Like, my joke, you're a business owner, I'm a business owner. You start thinking about your own stuff and, and the amount of, business owners that we've run across and it's not it's not their fault it's the nature of the beast the business is very all-encompassing it takes all of your energy and any energy you have left over goes to your family yeah. so often your own stuff is what's we always call it you know it's important but it's not urgent and yeah. so they'll you know the old phrase the cobbler's kids have holes in their shoes like you're always last you always look at yourself last you know and so we try to just tell people we know that it's not urgent we know that the, the 30 voicemails and the, all the emails are more important but just carve a little bit of time out, be intentional again, let's lay out what you want to happen, let's, let's make sure that that's clear, and let's lay out the plan so that no one's caught short. Yeah, we, uh, we actually, I, years ago, I saw uh, a talk on this uh, program for, called The Four Disciplines of Execution, hmm. uh, which is through Franklin Covey uh, Consulting Firm. Yeah. Um, but it's all about strategic execution, like you can be strategic, Right. Mm -hmm. But unless you have like an actual plan with like accountability <laughs> right. to execute, like yeah. whatever. And the thing that they talk about, um, their phrase is the whirlwind. Yeah. Uh, and the whirlwind is just life. Life <laughs> is going to act on you. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, and they, the, the idea being that they don't want you to be dismissive of the whirlwind because it's a reality of, of your work life. You know what I yeah. mean? Something comes up, there's, uh, you know, a, a client issue that needs to be addressed or there's, you know, you got to hire someone or whatever it's going to be like stuff that acts on you constantly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, but the idea being that, you know, the wildly important things you have to focus at least say 10 to 20% of your energy on, right. Otherwise mm -hmm. nothing's going to get done. Right. So oh. like when I think about these things and that's why, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on here as the inaugural uh, yeah. fellow podcaster, <laughs> Tyler Qualio, uh, was that I think that you and I share a similar amount of like respect and, uh, you know, weight that we want to give towards some of these strategies that can really be forward thinking 
yeah. and get out of you know trouble before it ever happens. Yeah, and I, people, there's all kinds of behavioral finance studies on if, are people motivated by fear or by greed's a bad word, but offense or defense, right? And so a lot of times you talk about these things and people maybe fall into the trap of thinking everything we're talking about is defense, but in, in reality, if you have a plan and you know what you want to do and you know what you need to get out of the business to be financially independent and all these things, it actually can put you in a position of being uh, much more uh, offensive. Yeah. And, and that's some of the work you guys do is understanding that you might be able to get a whole other turn or two from a multiple if yeah. you have you know, the right mid middle management in place and you have systems and processes and your books are cleaned up and you have a a financial strategy that makes sense and has been thought about. And so that's one of the things I do fight against is I find myself maybe too often um, or people think that we're talking about defense the whole time. And while yeah. that's critically important, it, there's an offensive component. So I tell people, if you're one that's motivated more by offense, then this can help too. It's not yeah. just one that... Well, everybody plays offense better when they're in a place of security. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I when they that. know that if I go and take a chance on this or if I really pursue this growth strategy that, you know, the foundation isn't going to crumble from under, underneath right. me or, or, you know, whatever. You're not going to, you know, go out on a whim on something and, and have it blow back on you tremendously. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, sort of what we're talking about here is going to kind of get to the core of it. So, yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, like, you know, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but one of the things I appreciate, you know, about you um, and, you know, when people think of the term wealth management, I think to your earlier point, I think people start to think about financial advisory. Yeah. Right. Or and, investment and advice. Investment yeah. advice, you know, specifically. But I've always thought, you know, our conversations just around this stuff, um, it's almost like you know, we're peers, you know, that are thinking along the same lines about yeah. things. And, and, you know, like I, for our clients, I know that like, I'm always thinking about like, what are ways that I can, you know, help them grow or help them manage risk or help them uh, just reduce the amount of noise, you know, that's the going on in their life or, you know, whatever, but like a holistic perspective, I, I think is kind of how I characterize it. And, and I think you you share that, you know, sort of mentality and sentiment about it, right? Yeah, um, well, it, collaborating is critically important. I think if you're not working, if your wealth advisor isn't working with your attorney and your accountant and your CFO um, in, in some levels, especially if you're a closely held business owner, it, it, you're getting everyone's um, best effort, but maybe they're not a most effective effort, right? Yeah. Because there's there's room between those gaps and so you need overlap and you need a coordinated approach and we do a line on a lot of that stuff and yeah. I've always appreciated that. Well, and I think too, it's, um, it's uh, you know, what I found um, when I'm talking with um, a client or even just a friend, um, you know, their attorney or their advisor, you know, whatever, there's all sorts of people that can be involved in the equation. At times it could be a little bit you know, standoffish, right? Where it's yeah. like, who's the wisest person in the room? Kind of thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I think there's also an inherent fear of people that um, they're going to be exposed or something. Yeah. And so it's always this little cat and mouse game early on. But if you can just get people that are comfortable with each other and, and realize that you're all here for the end client and that no one's going to make each other look bad. And it, you know, at the end of the day, the client's most important. So yeah, there's, 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 uh, strength and our numbers and skills and abilities and at the end of the day we're all supposed to be rowing in the same direction yeah no one's got a monopoly on all the good ideas <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, mean, I learn all the time from you yeah but. yeah that is that is i love that you just keep on feeding me you know good one line over podcast and I'm, yeah, and I'm, just gonna keep on, you know, I'm gonna use them and claim that they're mine and <laughs> it's perfect not give you credit for it um all right but so over the course of time uh We've had a lot of conversations just in passing, um, but you always got all these like ideas that fall outside the scope of like, uh, you know, for me, like running a financial forecast model or 
reviewing all the insurance coverages to make sure that, you know, where are the gaps, right? Looking at operational KPIs, like all the traditional stuff that like a CFO, COO typically mm -hmm. looks at, right? right. <clears throat> and then to that, you always have these, you know, nuggets of wisdom that trickle down from your neck of the woods that don't fall in the classic category of like investment, right? And I've mm -hmm. always sort of been enthralled with some of these ideas because like, as you said them, I've been like, wow, that's a really good idea. I'm surprised more people don't talk about that. <laughs> you know, Do you happen to know? Can you remind me of some of these that I was? No, I'm <laughs> well, like the buy sell agreements, which yeah. you've already you, talked yeah. about is, yeah. is, is, you know, is one of those, right? Where I'm like, oh, well, that's a really easy way to, you know, solve a classical problem, right? But like, you know, yeah. maybe give me a couple. Very inexpensive of, too. Yeah. In well, general. let's start there yeah. with that one. And then maybe you got another idea Things that people don't commonly think about, right? Yeah. As you know, ideas to sort of manage both their business and their and their wealth, mm -hmm. right? But that you know you deal with on a regular basis. I think on the buy sell front, a lot of times people don't realize that they might have a business partner. Let's say we were partners, and you happen to know my wife, and I happen to know your wife, and we would have no problem potentially um, being business partners with them, but. In general, most people's spouses don't have, um, you know, the years of experience and the expertise, and at the end of the day, uh, probably don't want to be a business owner with uh, a half business owner, fifty percent owner in, in a business that they're not involved in every day. And the person who's left over, you know, after the sad event, also probably doesn't want a partner who. Maybe they have to answer to or have to um, uh, try to explain everything that's happening and why they make decisions. And at the end of the day, it, it's just healthier if the spouse of the deceased partner can be purchased at a formulaic uh, pre predetermined number or via, via a formula that the two partners agreed on when they were both you know, upright. And right. so... Um, most attorneys can do a buy sell agreement for, you know, one of the things you're not supposed to do is quote yeah. people's fees, but a very, uh, a very small number in my my opinion. Right. Um, and uh, term insurance, which is it's basically a commodity now, it's less than people's cable bill, um, the live streaming bill, whatever we want to call them now. Um, and you can fund this buy sell agreements can be funded or not funded. So the simple idea is we have a ten million dollar business. And I have a $5 million policy on you and vice versa. And by terms of the buy-sell agreement, you pass away. I'm forced to buy your 50% of your stock for the uh, proceeds of the insurance. The spouse and your family is set. They've got money. They got value out of what you built. Um, and now I have 100% of the shares and I can run the business. And I don't have a, a partner that might not want to be my partner and vice versa. And it's it's... It's amazing how many businesses don't have a buy sell and the ones that do that don't have it funded. And that's just a very easy thing. It, it, it brings a ton of comfort to, to both families that are partners. Yeah, absolutely. And if you think about it, not getting into the tax stuff too much, um, but I now have purchased half the business. So my basis in the business is now the $5 million I put in plus whatever other basis we had. So now if I sell the business down the road, I have a less of a tax hit, right? So it's it's just a very, it, it should be something that's much more common than it is. And so we handhold um, people through that process. Like um, I'm a lawyer by education, but I don't practice. And I uh, have all my buddies that, that practice. And yeah. uh, when I see them, they're, they're jealous uh, of me that I didn't go down that road. But uh, <laughs> um, no, but I have lots of good buddies and, and friends and stuff that are that are attorneys that we work very closely with, and I just think that's something you have to be an expert in. But we can translate, we can uh, in, make it in uh, let's say layman's terms. We can under, you know, help the client understand what's happening in these documents. Yeah, so that's a very common thing. I think. Um, yeah, when we talk about ideas that we talk about. That's that's one yeah. That should be I mean, that's more prevalent than it. And I mean, two questions following up on that. One would be. You know, I would imagine the idea would be on an annual basis, you're doing a business valuation or something like that. To, I mean, I know yeah. you can. You well, know. there's an, well, so 
that's a great question. So it can get expensive to do that, but depending on your business, it can it, updating it every year is not nearly as expensive as the first one that a, yeah. that a business valuation firm has to do. So that's one route for sure. Another route is that's where the formula comes in. So like in my business, it's very common in the wealth management space that a business might be worth two and a half or three times recurring revenue. So as long as the partners are fine with that formula, it doesn't need to be a new business valuation done every year. Right. And so you can wait it so it's not the most recent year. It's spread out over three years. But there's all kinds of things we can do to make it fair. And, but, but yes, uh, many, many of them require a business valuation annually if you don't have a formula that's, that can run. And the other question I'd have with um, the number of, say, partners not in like the legal sense of like a limited liability partnership or something like that, right? But number of owners, let's call it, right? No. In a business, like how much does the buy sell stuff scale up, you know, before it gets overly Unru unruly, unruly and yeah. complex? Yeah. Usually, if you have a lot of them, you'll do like kind of that plan we were talking about. So it's called a cross purchase plan. And you, I've seen it for up to 10 partners, but it can get pretty unruly. Um, so a lot of times, the more partners you have, it might turn into more like a stock redemption where the business itself is forced to buy the shares um, from the deceased partner's uh, family and they can do it over a three-year period or something like that. But that's what going to the attorney, that's what going to us, like just sitting down and rolling up your sleeves and spending an hour or two just really thinking about how you want it to operate can, can be effective. Uh, very good. What other, I mean, not to dwell on the morbidity yeah. uh, side of the equation, but uh, <laughs> we'll move on to a much more uh, lighthearted stuff here. <laughs> but are there other ideas that maybe besides buy-sell agreements um, that, you know, people have implemented that you've seen to be effective? Like one of the ideas I had was like, what if you had, you know, sort of a contingency base uh, board, mm -hmm. right, that kicked into kicked into effect, like, you know, hey, if this happens, you know, these three people that are, number one, my friends, or yeah. people that know me, or are wise in some way, shape, or form, uh, are now our board that can help, you know, guide, you know, a uh, surviving relative or whatever on, yeah. on, you know, what to do next kind of thing. Or, yeah, I think that's an extension of, of kind of what we talked about earlier, which is having these conversations ahead of time. So. Yeah. If business owner says to spouse, if something happens to me, these are the three people you call immediately. Here's the, the exit plan that I've created and it's in my top drawer. We call it a fire drill. We'll do that for people and say, let's just pretend something happened to you today. What really happens? So we try to lay out this exit plan, the game plan and fire drill for people. And it does lay out the important people involved in the, um, um, in their life that can help them. So obviously if you were involved in someone's situation, which I think is another great reason to have third row involved is it, you would be top of that list, right? You know, where all, you know, how the business operates, you know, um, so giving certain people access to the checking accounts right away. Right. Um, having somebody come in that's going to help run and, and even a plan where we say these top five people, you give them an immediate $50,000 stay bonus so that they have to work for a year or two so that they don't bail on you because they're worried about their own family and their own livelihood because you know, maybe the patriarch and the matriarch who ran the company is no longer here. So yes, creating an advisory board, creating um, a, a true exit plan to help people figure out what would happen. Um, to stay on the more uh, morbidity thing one more time, you mentioned it earlier, which I just think is really important. And we've seen this a lot. I've been doing this for 21 years and there's been a number of situations where everyone just is so um, hung up, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but they're hung up on um, being equal, right? So I have two kids. So right. I just immediately, your plan says, I'm going to leave you know, half and half to my two girls. And in reality, especially if you have two or three or four kids, a lot of times it's, we talk about what's equitable versus what's equal. And a good example of that would be, let's say you know, daughter's involved in the business, um, but the son is not. Well, you have to have a real conversation about if you leave it everything 50-50, now son who's not involved, we call it like an inactive um, member of the family, is now going to be an inactive partner. And so now sister who's been there 
putting their time, sweat, blood, tears into the whole thing, understands it. Um, at the end of the day, let's say there's a million dollars of profit, right? Well, son's like, where's my half a million? And daughter has to go through the painful discussion of, well, we have to reinvest in the business once in a while. And yeah. there's a, an immediate potential distrust. And it's just, and then we've seen it the other way, where sometimes um, the person who got left the business is like, oh my gosh, the other sibling, you know, I wish I had all the cash, right? So just having these conversations around, let's be equitable and not equal per se. And getting a business is a great thing because you can make a living on it. But a lot of late nights, a lot of ulcers, a lot of dealing with employees, a lot of stuff that goes with being a business owner. And so just being a little more, again, going back to this word, you know, strategic or, or purposeful is, is an important factor, I think, anytime you're dealing with exit planning or business succession planning. Yeah. I've seen a few businesses where there's family members that, you know, they just are coming from different places, you know what yeah. I mean? And they may have their own career or they may have their own interests. And, yep. you know, that's a really thorny and complicated problem, you know, to solve, you know. And there's even businesses that have, you know, moving on from a great topic to another great topic. But um, business owners should really talk to each other a lot about divorce. Yeah. Because you know? all of a sudden... You might have, you know, if you and your spouse divorced and we were business partners, now I might have two partners, right? And so there are actually buy-sell arrangements and stuff that kick in in the event of a divorce. And so there's, oh, wow. ready, there's ready cash available and then you can sort out your situation and your divorce, but it's not shares of the business. And you're not caught up in three years of litigation and a, and a nightmare situation. So that's one that people don't think a lot about either. And, Disability, you know, a lot of times people do buy sales only for passing away, but you could be a disabled where yeah. now all of a sudden I'm doing all the work yeah, and you're you're unable to do the work, but you still own half the shares and now we have to figure out how that works. So just, it's not fun, you know, get a bottle of bourbon and sit down and just Knock hash out. it out over a day or two, but have the uncomfortable conversations, but at least have them, you know, I think it's really important. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned long-term disability because uh, I found that that's one, I mean, that's, well, there's several, I think a future topic for, yeah. you know, the podcast here is on, uh, you know, sort of the, the hidden insurance coverages, the one that, the ones that every time yeah. they get brought up, people are like, no, 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 we don't need that. Yeah, yeah. You know, because there are several that you're like, uh, be careful what you wish for here, right? Because yeah. But like long-term disability is one of those ones that like people don't think about the scenario of, oh, I got hit by the bus, but didn't die. Pass away. Or whatever. Right. Exactly. You know, and yeah. now, but now I'm disabled. I can't work. Yeah. And how do I continue to make an income? How does this thing survive? You know, like. And very different if you own a factory or, you know, you have widgets that still kick out, even though you're unable to work, but you're in a service business. I'm in a service business. A lot of businesses require you know, the intellect or the um, the ability to go to work every day by the owner. And that's where it's particularly important. The other thing mostly a lot is we have a lot of highly compensated executives and their group disability plan says it's 60% of salary and, yep. um, and it's tax-free. So they think, well, 60% of my salary tax-free, I'm in pretty good shape. But then you read the fine print and it says, but capped at 10 grand a month yeah. or 15 grand a month. And these people are used to making the seven figures or whatever, and um, all of a sudden there's a significant gap there. And so, you know, surgeons, other people like that that we work with, uh, it is something that is a, a, a terribly uninsured, um, underinsured uh, arena. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we touched a little bit on, um, you know, generational you know, getting off the morbid train for a minute. Yeah, let's talk about the, yeah, fun, let's talk stuff about the fun stuff here. Yeah. Um, speaking of bourbon, um, <laughs> but uh, we talked about, um, you know, family-owned businesses too. And, you know, everybody knows sort of the adage of the first generation builds it, the yeah. second generation grows it, third generation destroys it kind of thing. Um, not always, you know, true, obviously, or anything like that. But the complexities that are involved yes. are deep and wide, yes. you know, with that, right? Um, and I know that you and I have talked about, you know, different situations that you've sort of dealt with in terms of 
um, you know, maybe the founder wants to step away from the business and they've got, you know, family members that are their, you know, their children's or, or spouses of their children or whatever might be taken over um, or any number of things generationally that pass through besides buy sell stuff, which is yeah. mostly triggered upon some sort of tragic event, right? Yeah. What are, you know, any other ideas, you know, like things that you've done that, you know, you've shown to be very valuable in, in those types of circumstances? Yeah, and, and this isn't always the case by any means, and I've seen it work without this, but one of the, one of the things that we've seen that's helped people a lot is uh, younger um, incoming child go work somewhere else first. And that's not necessarily to say, look how bad it is elsewhere. You know how lucky you are to be coming into the family business. But it does give perspective. It actually is really cool for the business because when Whippersnapper comes back, um, they can they can bring ideas and stuff that you know. A lot of times, as a business owner, we get our way, you know, and because we're in it all day, every day, and we kind of have blinders on in some regards. So, so sending people out, I think, is an important um, thing. Beyond. Um, Beyond that, it just gives them some real life experience, and I think they do, frankly, appreciate coming back and <laughs> into the family business then when they've when they've been on the other side of the fence a little bit. Um, the other thing we've seen, which I think really helps younger people coming into their family business, is if they have um, a program where they have to work six months in the warehouse, and then six months in sales, and six months in procurement, and six months in HR, and it gives them a 360 view of the business, but also um, depending on how they handle themselves when they're in those roles, and you hope you know, in a very humble way, but uh, it, they get to meet more people in the organization. They get to understand the day-to-day -day struggles that the warehouse people have or you know, the problems that you know, we know, all know HR is a nightmare. So you know, <laughs> dealing in that world for six months or a year or something can really open someone's eyes. So those are... Those are a couple of uh, a couple of things that have helped. Another one that we've done, uh, especially early on, before kids are even getting into the business, is a lot of our clients are pretty philanthropic, and we use a lot of what are called donor advised funds, which are basically uh, used to be called a poor man's charitable foundation. And I hate that moniker, uh, and, and because uh, a it doesn't even work anymore because Mark Zuckerberg used it to leave a billion dollars to the. Uh, uh, Community Foundation of Silicon Valley, so it can't be a poor man's thing anymore. But it just means that it's it's a lot easier, simpler way to set up. It's a lot more tax friendly. There's all kinds of uh, uh, compliance friendly. So I mean, we do a lot of that. But we'll have clients that early on put some money in there, and they'll have their kids have to report to them every year, and have gone out and researched two or three charities that were close to them, and 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 give a report to the family about. Hey, I know I'm allowed. I'm allocated five thousand dollars this year to give to charity out of our donor advice fund. But here's why I picked this charity. You know, here's why I did X, Y, and Z. And so we do a lot of that. That's for younger kids. Um, as you get a little bit older, though, there's this concept called the family bank, which is kind of a cool concept. And families who have a lot of wealth and have done real well, they can, even if it's outside the family business, they can certainly support one of the children to go out and start a restaurant or start a tech business or some sort of startup. But um, instead of just giving them the money to do that, they try best you can to act like you're the bank and you require a business plan and you require all kinds of market research and they have to come to you and you have two or three family members that essentially sit on the board of the family bank and there's a real loan agreement and everything. It doesn't mean that you can't forgive that loan over time and use your, your gifting capability to do that. But I think that's a really interesting way to just instead of saying, yeah, here's you know, 500 grand to go and do your thing. Yeah. So those are some high level ideas. And are those similar to, um, I know I've seen some of these, uh, you know, in the past, um, you know, at nonprofits that we've worked with where, you know, when the donation is made, essentially, like, let's just pick a number, let's say somebody puts $100,000 into one of these donor advised funds yep. in 2022. It's almost like they made that charitable donation in 2022. Yeah, so we use it quite often. It fast forwards the deduction. 
Yes. And, and there's some limitations and stuff you just have to work with your accountant on, and we understand all those. But the really cool thing is we have somebody sell a business, or we have somebody um, sell a piece of real estate, or they have a huge year at work. Um, they have a bunch of options come due. It's a big income year. We can, and you look at somebody's return, and let's say they, on average, give you know, $15,000 a year to charity. Well, if they wanted to give 150000 for instance, in that year, they can fast forward the deduction in the year that they're getting crushed by taxes. Yep. And they can, um, going forward, uh, if they think about it, that can be basically they set aside 10 years of giving. But the cool thing is the donor advice fund gets to be invested. Right. So hopefully you get some growth out of it, and it's not 10 years of giving. It turns into 12, 14, 15 years of giving, right? Right. The other thing we do is if there's not a big event, we'll talk to a lot of clients about donor advised funds and say, let's say they're 55 and they're going to work for 10 more years. I often ask them, like, you're not going to stop being charitable when you're retired, right? And they're like, no, I'm going to continue. Well, for the next 10 years, you're going to make a lot of money and have a much higher bracket. Let's fund all of your retirement charitable giving in these 10 years where we can really appreciate the deduction. Mm. So that's another way that we utilize those. Very good. Um, switching to more increasingly uh, exciting <laughs> topics from the from the from the morbid start. Yeah. Uh, you and I have a common interest in sort of the you know call it what's M and A market, yeah. right? You know, I've got a lot of history um, there in my career. Um, you know, I think our clients, if not already, will be. You know potentially pursuing, you know, that route. Um, yeah. you know, I've, I've been down that road before. Um, there's the, one of the things that I now, when it comes up sort of forewarn people about is that, you know, it's incredibly emotional <laughs> yeah. and That's incredibly sure. emotional mm -hmm. and a lot more complicated than people think it's going to be like people want it For to sure. be a real estate transaction where you, you know, agree on a price, they do the inspection, you know, you show up to closing and get a check, you know, kind yep. of thing. That That's doesn't happen. <laughs> it's yeah. it's far more emotional uh, than that. And uh, there's a lot more digging around. There's complicated, cash, complicated aspects of the structure of deals, whether it be, you know, seller financing or, you know, the working capital peg is the thing that always just, you know, blows people's mind. Uh, they don't know what to do with it. Um, you know, anyway, but I love it, you know, one yeah. way or the other, right? You like it's, complexity. Well, yeah, I like complexity. And, you know, it's also, you know, I think in most, not all, but a lot of business owners' minds, uh, sort of some end game, right? That mm -hmm. whether it be they recapitalize the business and take some chips off the table and share some counter, common ownership with somebody else and, and, you know, stay somewhat in the game um, or take all the chips off the, off the shelf or whatever and provide that stability, you know, for their family going forward. Um, there's just a lot of, you know, nuance to it. And I know, you know, you've been involved yeah. um, with those transactions in a way that's different than me, different than an attorney, uh, different than an investment banker, yeah. um, you know, whatever. And I was just curious, like, in your experience, you know, what are some of the things that like either are common that come up or they're like strategies that come up or I don't know, just like when I, yeah. like somebody walked up to you today and was like, Hey, I'm thinking about selling my business or I'm under LOI and you know, we're supposed to close in 90 days. Yeah. You know, what do you got for me? It's like, <laughs> no, I, that, I can well, appreciate like that. We talk about, That's how it happens a lot. Well, and we talk about, uh, that's a, that's a one thing about owning a business is a lot of your stored wealth, right? Yeah. Is massively illiquid, right? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you can't touch it. You can't, you know, look in your, you know, online account and see your balance, right? You know, yeah. the, the value of it yeah. is who knows, yep. right? Depends on Someone's any willing to number pay for of factors. Yeah, yeah, right. It's, so it's what work somebody's willing to pay for it, right? But, but you know, man, that whole idea of having all your eggs in that, you know, basket, yeah. you know, to me is like, you know, both exciting, you know, that you've built something that might be worth something, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's significant. But I would imagine that most people at a minimum, unless they have a succession plan within their family, yeah. right, where they really yeah. want to keep it within their family. But I, 
<clears throat> I would have to imagine that, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, sort of have uh, at least a vision for what that might look like, right? Yeah. Everybody's got their number, let's say. Yeah. You know, and they may not know what it is, but a number. There is a number at which, you know, it would make sense, right? So in your experience, right, somebody comes up to you off the street, says, hey, here's what I'm thinking about, or yeah. this person just knocked on my door and handed me an LOI for this amount of money. Like, what's your reaction? Like, what's your... Yeah, I think a couple different things. One is you stated emotional earlier, and that's, that's so true. Uh, business owners, especially if they don't have children or if children aren't local or they don't have a, um, a huge social life and they don't do a lot of, like a lot of times the business is their baby, right? And it's, it's how they're defined. Um, and the idea of not being that business owner any longer, I don't think they give enough credence to. Um, and, and that can be, I've seen people spun out for years after doing it. Yeah. Um, and then I've also seen other ones that, flourish afterwards because they realized, oh my gosh, my whole life was this business. And, and now I can, there's so much more out there in the world and I have the financial capability to take advantage of it. So, so I just think really thinking through, um, is this, does it define you? What's it going to look like when you're gone? Uh, this idea of, um, I have a client right now who recently sold and it's been, um, it's been surprising because they sold to a strategic and that strategic has actually left them alone and oh. they're doing great. And uh, he's super happy. And I just uh, was with him the other day and I just had to tell him like, that's super rare. <laughs> like, most of our business owners, they're supposed to work two or three years or whatever. And very rarely do they make it past a year. You know, it's, it's uh, uh, they were doing, used to doing it their way. And then mm -hmm. even how accounting's done and how KPIs are done and all kinds of, performance metrics and things that um, it's just a different ballgame when you sell to somebody else. And it's a very different thing if you sell to a family office versus uh, private equity versus a strategic. And so um, just thinking about those things and using somebody or a team of people that have been through it, because even if you're an incredibly successful entrepreneur and a serial entrepreneur, maybe you sell, if you're lucky, three businesses in your life, maybe. So working with experts who have sold thousands yeah. it, it just puts you in a position uh, they just have a wealth of knowledge you're just never going to have um, so I so I highly recommend that I do think about what's their life going to look like what does your day look like when the business is when you don't no longer own it right yeah. just really go through that exercise talk to your yeah. friends and your spouse and your kids and all that um, so that's kind of some of the softer stuff the other thing we talk a lot about and I know you guys do a tremendous amount of work here which is great is I heard this phrase when I first started, um, thieving rights. And um, when we help, we help business owners and we do all their comprehensive modeling about like, well, what do you spend and what do you earn and, and what, what does retirement look like for you and those types of things. And they'll, they'll give me like what they spend. And I'm like, this looks really light. <laughs> <laughs> it, no, yeah. oh, no, 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 no. Oh, they're like, well, you know gas and the car and insurance and my phone and my kid's phone and everything runs through the business, right? Well, it's if you get a, yeah, if you get a complicated or a, a sophisticated buyer, they just chop, chop that like crazy. And, yeah. And so getting ready for a sale, which is some of the work you guys do, which is fantastic, is as painful as it is, you got to take that stuff out um, or at least be prepared for it to be taken out and then realize what your real multiple is and what's yeah. left over. Um, but also understanding what your lifestyle, what does it cost to be John Frank uh, in retirement, you know, and uh, um, and not what does it cost to be John Frank when you can run some expenses through, right? Yeah. So, so that's, that's a big part. The other thing I think for us is you said everyone's got a number, but um, I've been in some si it's situations with clients and they, like we'll show them just, you need a non-emotional mathematical way to determine yeah. is, is $10 million enough for me to, to live, right? And everyone says, well, of course it is, right? But then, you, you know, what if taxes come off of that? And what if you had these desires to leave each one of your kids a million bucks or whatever? And, and what if you have a very expensive lifestyle and you don't realize how expensive it is? But having 
people get hung up on multiples or people get hung up on um, like what their friend got or if they yeah. think they're getting screwed or not, to be honest, right? In reality, those are all things that don't matter nearly as much as are you 100% success chance on you and your spouse and your kids being able to do what they want to do? And if you know that number, then that is much more important and puts you in a position to know what you need to get out of the business in a um, hot market, in a soft market. And it really can can limit some of the emotions that you feel as you go through the negotiation process. Right. As long, if you know you need eight million and eight's your number and you want you were hoping for ten and now they come back at nine and a half, you're still a million and five over what you needed. Yeah. But if you thought or didn't have any clue and you just got hung up on ten because it's a nice round number, and now they come back at nine and a half and you blow the whole deal up and you're apoplectic about how brutal this you know trying to they're trying to rip you off for five hundred, it's it just puts you in a position, I think, to be much um, wiser and, and, and strategic about how you go about the sale process. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think it's very wise what you said about um, just are you ready for, like, even if, like, what does your day look like? And everybody has this sort of, like, utopian view of, like, you know, golf courses and yeah. umbrella drinks and, you know, like, it's just that's what I do now, you that's know? Right. Yeah. But, like... In reality, that's not probably what you're going to do. Well, you know right? I'm a huge golfer, right? And <laughs> I still can't play. Like, I couldn't imagine playing more than, like, three days a week. But there's a lot of guys and, and women that retire and think they're going to go play six, seven days, and all of a sudden they get super burned out on golf. And, and that's all they were thinking about, right? So I do think, what are your hobbies? And who are you going to hang out with? And where are you going to live? And do you want a second home? And um, But what is you gonna edit some? Are you gonna audit some classes? Like, yeah. You want to learn another language? Like, what are you gonna do? Or are you gonna take some of these proceeds, and maybe you're gonna back your kids in a couple of businesses, so you get to scratch that itch, you know, of, yeah. of being an entrepreneur, of thinking of those things. But, but the ones that get caught and and kind of uh, float around aimlessly for a couple of years afterwards and really struggle are, are people that don't, I think, put enough time and effort into thinking about what what does their day look like post sale. Yeah, I think about. <clears throat> The word identity, you know what I mean? Like, just as your name, last yeah. name is Qualio, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, you could never imagine not being Tyler Qualio, right? You yeah, know, some other like, idea. I've seen this happen, you know, uh, multiple times yeah. uh, over the years where people can't decouple, you know, themselves as the, you know, founder or owner or leader or whatever of the business and and something that's not that. You know, where it's like, yeah, you see people in like a shell of their former selves because all their confidence and everything came through being this owner and they had this stature in the community and all this stuff. And all of a sudden it's not there. Yeah. And it's, you know, supposed to be the happiest moment of your life when you sell your, your business. I'd be right? perfectly fine with <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I'd right, be perfectly right. fine. No. <laughs> uh, no, but that's really, really important for, I think, for people to consider because, you know, like you said, the numbers are what they are. And I think that that yeah. like quantitative, non you know, discretionary objective way of looking at it, like, hey, the numbers work and they're the real numbers, not like the, you know, I'm never gonna buy a car again numbers, right? right? Like real solid numbers and if they work, you know, great. And then, you know, the next piece is the, you know, emotional piece. Like, are you really, really, really ready to do this, right? Or at least, you know, ready to do it at least for now. Yeah. You know, and then take time off. And like you said, maybe they pursue, you know, uh, charitable uh, causes oh, or maybe they pursue, you know, helping out, you know, their kids start a business or other people that start a business or freelance here and there or, you know, whatever it might be. But um, that's really important. Um, yeah. And I think the other thing I would say to them is, OK, you want to sell your business or you have an opportunity to. Are your books in order? Because I know they're going to get dinged if they don't. You know, yeah. do you have do you have key people locked up? And even if you're not going to sell, but you're ready to transfer to to junior, you know, have you kept your key people there, or did some of those key people think they were going to maybe run it, and now all of a sudden they're going to feel like they got jumped over by by junior? And uh, I think locking people up with golden handcuff plans, and and there, people don't realize there's these plans out there that. Um, they're what's called non-qualified, right? So qualified plans are four hundred one ks, and qualified simply means they they fall under ERISA and they have to be offered to everybody in the business. 
But there are non-qualified plans which are allowed to be discriminatory, meaning you can pick three key people in the business and you can lock them up and they can have five, 10, 15 year vesting schedules on them and, and you can make it worth their while to hang around. So even if they got jumped over by junior or even if they thought they were gonna run the business and all of a sudden you sold it, whoever buys the business has to honor that plan or at least pay them out of that plan, right? So, so there's, there's change of control bonuses so they can feel comfortable that if all of a sudden you sell the business and they were caught off guard that they're gonna receive some of those dollars. So yep. um, that's what I would say to somebody to say, if it's a good enough number and it's really a hot market and they're paying a lot more than what it's worth, maybe you do fast forward and take advantage of it and go for it. But again, if you can hold off a year or two get everything in order, take out those thieving rights, like everything, get middle management locked in. Like you, you're probably going to get another turn plus if you, yeah, if you well, the right it's turn. another turn plus, plus it's a better number, you know, on the bottom line, probably in all likelihood. <laughs> Absolutely. It's you not know? all about sale, right? It's yeah. like, you know, the people move there, like they're going to move and then they paint their cabinets and yeah. clean out their basement and all that stuff. And they're like, Oh man, I wish I would have done this like five yeah. years ago. So I could have enjoyed it. Yeah. I think so many people finally do the right things at the end to clean up make their business yeah. run efficiently. And I know that's one of the big things you guys do is, can we just do this now when you can enjoy yeah. it instead of waiting to the end? Yeah, it's I mean, I've, I've literally sat in the room with um, people from private equity groups and, you know, their words when they were, you know, talking about their interest in a, in a business or whatever, um, <clears throat> you know, their words were, well, we're comfortable with pursuing this because most companies don't have junk, yeah. you know? And I think what they are talking about their, you know, not to, you know, cast light on me or third road management or whatever, but like most, well, most businesses, you know, small to mid-sized organizations, the type of companies that, you know, we find a good fit with, yeah. you know, don't spend the time, energy, resources, whatever it is to just make things work right, you know? Yeah. And, you know, in particular in a sales scenario, now my past, you know, I did quality of earnings analysis on m and deals. I, yep. you know, underwrote the debt side of a lot of M&A deals. So, like, I've been in and around it, and I know what a good company looks like, right? You'd be, like, a fantastic, you know, third-base coach going through that whole thing. Right. Because somebody's you know, been through it. It's, yeah. Like I said earlier, it's just a big I deal. I mean, you talk about thieving rights. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, and just so we're perfectly clear, what you're yeah. talking about is, like, Families using the business as their piggy bank for whatever it is that yeah. they're pulling money out of there. And sometimes it's not even all illegitimate stuff. Like, I mean, you might use your car for business and so you write it off, but now right. you don't own the business anymore. Right. And all of a sudden you have a car payment. Right. right. So it's not all nefarious stuff right. or anything, but it's just like people get caught off guard on that. Yeah. I don't recommend anything that would raise any flags to the IRS, but, you know, just using simple math here, right? Let's say uh, your EBITDA with, uh, you know, with the numbers artificially low, mm -hmm. for example, is say 500,000, right? But if you have three years of track history without pulling family expenses out of the business, right? Your multiple might be, or your, sorry, your EBITDA, let's just say making up a number is 700,000, right? Yeah. Well, now you're talking about say $200,000 on a five times multiple, even just assuming the same multiple mm -hmm. because it's whatever, that's a million dollars, right? Yep. You add on top of it that the person buying the business doesn't have to go in there and look at everything with a, you know, right. fine tooth comb to make sure they're not buying, you know, junk, mm -hmm. right? Maybe that multiple is not five. Maybe it's five and a half. You know, I don't know. I'm making yeah, it so up. Yeah, a confidence like, level on the buyer for yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The, yep. the, the cleaner things are, you know, from a financial record perspective, you know, the cleaner things are from an operational perspective, you know finance operations marketing sales like the more buttoned up everything is the more confident the buyers are the more buyers there will be mm -hmm. right and at the end of the day you're trying to create a feeding frenzy right yeah. and that's the whole concept absolutely and that's the way you know if i were to like you know separate the market a little bit right the five million dollar and below companies right behave a lot differently than five million dollar and above companies i'm talking about like based on revenue or uh, sorry on ebitda yeah. Right. Absolutely. You know, they just behave differently because the ones that, you know, are above five million are generally, <clears throat> you know, they have institutional interests. 
you know what I mean? Like yeah, from private equity firms and things like more that. More structure and oversight. Completely. Yeah, yeah, more structure and oversight, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, yeah, we can we can go on and on about that. Yeah. But um, well, awesome, man. I really appreciate you being here and your wisdom. Uh, love passion through this stuff with you. Thank you. Um, you are guest number one on on the. Uh, I'll always be. On, and you that. always be. Not. You know, you can write that on your LinkedIn. <laughs> right, well, First guest on Drive sure. by Entrepreneur Club yeah. But before you go, I do have four questions for you. Okay. And I reserve the right to change these four questions just to put that out there in the world. Okay. Because right. I made these up on the fly. <laughs> and am, maybe we'll change them. But they're yeah. unique to you and maybe we'll use the same ones. Maybe we won't. But okay. anyway. All right. Yeah. Favorite podcast. Besides the drive-by, yeah, you podcast. took my line. No, yeah. so besides this one, of course. Yeah. Um, Malcolm Gladwell's Revisionist History. Love that I one. Enjoy that one. Yeah. Yes, yeah. love that one. It really opens your eyes to some to some things, and you might not agree with it all the time, but it really is a paradigm shift on historical events. In yeah, he's. Uh, I liken him like he catches a lot of grief, right? At times. Mm -hmm. um, He's kind of like a historical fiction writer where it's like yeah. most of it's true and he's kind of <laughs> stringing it together into a narrative, but I do love it. He's a great storyteller. Yep. Uh, loved his books and everything else. All right. More so on the fun side. <clears throat> fun time. Best concert. Best concert. Best concert you've ever been to. Um, I saw the National open for Arcade Fire at UIC Pavilion. And... Uh, uh, Arcade Fire, just unbelievable effort, and uh, just fantastic. Uh, that's I've been there before. I was there some years ago. Yeah. Uh, smaller venue. Was this earlier on in their uh, sort of yeah. like collective right after fame? The, after Neon Bible, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Nice. That's now, now they're at you know United Center and all kinds of things. Yeah, so, probably multiple um, nights. Still, you know, yeah, it's good size, but it was it was fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. All right. The place that you've uh, that you've been that everybody should visit one time? Well, um, I was engaged in Malta, which is Ooh. a nation floating in the Mediterranean just south of Sicily. Okay. Uh, a ton of history there, and it's uh, it's really cool. It's uh, easy to get to from a standpoint of easy to be there. It's uh, They speak Maltese, but all English is, or all business is conducted in English and stuff, too, so it's super easy. And the capital city of Valletta is just gorgeous. And do you fly into Malta? You can fly or into fly? Malta, but typically you'll go through Heathrow or you'll go through uh, Rome or Florence. Got it. Yeah, it's great though. And is it one of those places with like the houses on the stilts, you know, kind of thing? And oh the, no, definitely much more like um, it's, it's a it's very arid, very rocky. Um, okay. But you know, Malta is, or uh, Valletta itself is this ancient walled city, um, and they withstood like a tremendous amount of bombing during World War II by the by the Nazis and everything. And they so a prideful country. Oh. There's only three hundred thousand people who live there. Okay. So, and there's you're... one little island called Camino, and only five people live on this island. And there is a hotel out there, so that's where that's where we were engaged. So at cool. the, that the at the island of five people. Yeah. Wow, are you guys like was, local celebrities? Or no, anything I was like that? I was studying there, so stuff was able to come over. Okay. All right. Very cool. All right, last question. If you were not doing your current mm. profession, your expertise, right? Yeah. Doing what you do at Sentinus, uh, what other line of work would you see yourself doing? I think, and I almost went down this road, so I can say it, but uh, probably be an athletic director at a college. Okay. I had some really good internships in that arena, and um, I have a sports law certificate and everything, so I almost went there, but seven years of private loans and uh you got to start off real small and you got to yep. jump schools and move your family a bunch and so i grew up in one spot and so i kind of wanted that for my kids as well and, um and i wanted to i'm a capitalist i want to make some money too <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that yep all right well thank you tyler qualio thank you Appreciate being on the it. uh inaugural show i'm honored to be here and, and thanks for having me and I really appreciate everything you do, so it's good. Likewise. Likewise. Talk to you soon, though. All right. Hi, I'm John Frank, founder and CEO of Third Road Management, and I just want to say thanks 
for listening in or perhaps viewing the Drive-By Entrepreneur Podcast. My true hope is that this content inspires meaningful change for you and your organization. I hope you enjoy it.